In a number of applications, a mechanical assembly may undergo significant temperature changes. For example, temperatures in the combustion chamber of an IC engine may increase from room temperature to 2,500 degrees Celsius when in operation. You may have experienced heating of a laptop or other electronics too. A change in temperature produces thermal strains, which may cause unwanted deformation and warping. Thermal strains may also produce mechanical stress, which, if excessive, might lead to failure. However, the temperature distribution over a mechanical assembly is not always known beforehand, and we may need to perform a thermal analysis to obtain that. In this video, we will show how to link results from a thermal analysis to a structural analysis in order to calculate the strains, stresses, and other results due to thermal loads. Ready? Let's go. Changes in temperature produce thermal strains. Thermal strains can cause mechanical stresses in certain cases. For example, if thermal gradients are present, or if the assembled materials have different coefficients of thermal expansion, or if constraints prevent free expansion of the material. Although the temperature distribution of an assembly is calculated in a thermal analysis, calculation of thermal strains and stresses is done in a structural analysis. If a component has a uniform temperature throughout, we can skip the thermal analysis and simply use the thermal condition to define the temperature. Thermal strains are calculated using the equation shown here, where the thermal strain is equal to alpha times delta T, where alpha is the coefficient of thermal expansion, or CTE in short, and it is a material property. The delta T refers to the change in temperature and can be written as T minus T ref, where T is the current temperature of the material, and T ref is the reference temperature at which thermal strains in the material can be considered to be zero. Based on this equation, we can see that any change in the temperature leads to generation of thermal strains. But does that always lead to stresses as well? As discussed before, thermal strains lead to stress when the structure is prevented from freely expanding or contracting. Let's take a look at a simple example to understand this concept. Say we have a bar with uniform cross-section and no constraints applied. Let the reference temperature for the bar of the material of the bar be 20 degrees Celsius. Now, if the bar is heated to a uniform temperature of 30 degrees Celsius, we can see that the bar can expand freely due to lack of any constraints. In this case, we see non-zero thermal strains. But since there are no constraints to prevent free expansion of the bar, the stresses produced are zero. Now let's fix the two ends of the bar and heat it again to a uniform temperature of 30 degrees Celsius. Since the bar is no longer allowed to expand freely, non-zero stresses are produced in the bar. This was an academic case with a simple geometry composed of a single material and having a uniform temperature throughout the body. In cases where the geometry is complex, or multiple materials with different CTEs, or the temperature distribution is not uniform, we need to use numerical simulations to calculate stresses and strains in the body. So let's go through a simple example and learn how to import temperature results from a thermal analysis into a static structural analysis and calculate the thermal strains and stresses. We are now in ANSYS Workbench. Here we have a completely solved steady state thermal analysis. Let's take a quick look at the model. We have a simplified PCB with different electronic components. We've assigned different materials to each component. For example, the PCB has been assigned FR4 material, the battery has been assigned lithium material, the microprocessor is made of silicon, and all other components are composed of aluminum for simplicity. The FR4 material is orthotropic, meaning it has different material properties in the three orthogonal directions. For the mesh, we define a global element size and set the element order to be linear. In terms of boundary conditions, we define internal heat generation on the microprocessor. We assume that force convection occurs on the fins of the heat sink and hence it has a higher film coefficient than that of the rest of the surfaces over which we assume natural convection. Looking at the results, we see the temperature distribution over the entire assembly with the maximum temperature occurring around the microprocessor. 
Next, we want to perform a thermal stress analysis to calculate the thermal strains and stresses that may be generated in the system due to this temperature distribution. So let's go back to Workbench. One common approach, which comes in handy when the same geometry and the same mesh is being used for both thermal and structural analyses, is to drag and drop a static structural system to the model cell of the thermal analysis. In this method, everything will be shared between the two analyses except the boundary conditions, i.e. they will have the same geometry, the same material assignment, and also the same mesh. However, in some cases, we may have slightly different geometry for the two analyses. For example, we may not want to consider bolts and fasteners in the thermal analysis, but include them in the structural analysis. Similarly, we may want to use different mesh densities or elements of different orders in the two cases. Using this method would restrict us from making these changes in the two analyses. So we will show another method in which we have more flexibility in defining the geometry and the mesh for the structural analysis. So let's drag and drop a static structural system. Since we'll be using the same material in both the analyses, we just drag and drop the engineering data cell from the steady state thermal system to the static structural system. For the geometry, we can import a new geometry if needed, but in this case, we will be using the same geometry. So drag and drop geometry cell from the thermal analysis to the static structural analysis. Now let's open ANSYS Mechanical by double clicking on the model cell. The first order of business is to assign a material to each component and assure that all the necessary material properties have been defined. So let's refer to the material assignment in the thermal analysis and define the material for each component. Since FR4 is an orthotropic material, we need to specify the element coordinate system that is aligned with the orthotropic material directions so that the material behavior is properly captured. To do this, right click on geometry, insert element orientation. Select the PCB component body as the geometry to which the element orientation is to be scoped. Let the definition be through surface and edge guide. Pick the bottom surface of the PCB and one of the edges for the surface and edge guides respectively. Right mouse button and pick Generate Orientations. We can see the element coordinate system that indicates the three material directions, red for X, green for Y, and blue for Z. Now let's look at one of the materials and see what properties have been defined. To perform a steady state thermal analysis, we need to define the thermal conductivities of various materials. But in order to perform a thermal stress analysis, in addition to the usual elasticity moduli and Poisson's ratios, we also need to define the coefficient of thermal expansion, or CTE in short, for each material. For a material like FR4, which is orthotropic, just like we define different elasticity moduli and Poisson's ratio in different directions, we may need to define different CTEs for each direction. Next, let's define the mesh. Let's set a similar element size to what we had in the thermal analysis. But instead of using linear elements, let's set the element order to be quadratic. We do this to avoid using linear elements, which are inherently stiff, and especially because we have a thin part with only one element in the thickness direction where the linear tetrahedron would not accurately capture the bending response. Now generate the mesh. Next, we'll be defining the boundary conditions and the loads. But before we do that, there's one important thing we need to do. Since this is a thermal stress analysis, we need to set the reference temperature or the temperature at which strains in the material are zero. To do this, let's click on static structural and under environment temperature, we can enter the desired value. Let's leave this value at 22 degrees Celsius. But what happens if the reference temperature is not the same for different bodies composed of different materials? In that case, we can specify a reference temperature for each body, and that would override the global reference temperature for that body. For example, 
Let's say the reference temperature of PCB is 30 degrees Celsius instead of 22. To set this, go to Geometry, click on PCB Component. In the details, set the reference temperature to be defined by body and enter 30 degrees Celsius in the reference temperature value. Now, all the bodies except the PCB will have a reference temperature of 22 degrees Celsius, while the PCB will have a reference temperature of 30. In this example, we'll keep things simple and use a single reference temperature for all the components. So revert back to reference temperature by environment. Next, let's insert cylindrical support and pick inner surfaces of the four holes. Set the radial and axial displacements to be fixed to idolize the PCB being held in place by standoffs, which are a type of fastener. The next step is to import the temperature distribution from the thermal analysis. To do this, let's go back to Workbench. Now drag the solution cell from the steady state thermal analysis and drop it to the setup cell of the static structural analysis. The pink line indicates data transfer from the thermal system to the structural system. Right click on the setup cell and refresh. Now let's go back to the mechanical window. We see that an imported load object has been created. Right click on imported body temperature and choose import load. First, we can see the contours of temperatures following the mapping and this should compare with the contours from the steady state thermal analysis. In the data view, we see that the source time is end time. If instead of performing a steady state thermal analysis, we had performed a transient thermal analysis, we would have obtained temperature distributions over multiple time points. In that case, we could specify which source time in the thermal analysis corresponds to which analysis time in the structural analysis, and even map a range or all time points if required. Coming back to the case at hand, let's confirm that the mapping of temperature from the thermal analysis is correct. To check this, go to Details of Imported Body Temperature and under Graphics Control, set Display Source Points to On. The black points on the geometry show the locations of the source points, and visually, it appears to spatially overlay our target geometry. Next, let's take a look at the Imported Load Transfer Summary. For the target body PCB, we see that the volume difference between the geometry and thermal analysis and this analysis is very small, which is expected since we use the same geometry and a similar mesh density. In case we're using different geometries or different mesh size, it's necessary to understand there may be a difference in volume due to mesh discretization differences, and in which case the tolerance can be increased or other mapping settings may be need to be tweaked in order for the mapping to be successful and accurate. Since we have different element orders in the two analyses, we do see a difference in the number of source and target nodes, but it is indicated that 100% of the nodes were mapped, which is what we want. Similarly, check all other components to confirm that the mapping of data has occurred correctly. Now that we have finished all the checks, right-click on Solution Insert Thermal Strain, Total Deformation, Equivalent Strain, and Equivalent Stress. Now right-click on Solution and solve the system. Looking at the contour plots of thermal strain and equivalent elastic strain, we see that different components have worked. Since we had different materials with different coefficients of thermal expansion, and also since we had constrained the PCB, we see non-zero stresses being produced. Looking at the total deformation, we can get an idea on how much we expect the board to deflect from this thermal condition. So finally, let's summarize the important points to remember. Change in temperature produces thermal strains. If free thermal expansion or contraction of the material is prevented, stresses will develop. Although temperature calculations are done in a thermal analysis, calculating the thermal strains requires a structural analysis. We learned that even when we have slightly different geometries or different meshes in the thermal and structural analyses, 
we can map the temperature results of the thermal analysis to the structural analysis to be used as thermal loads. We learned how to confirm that the mapping has occurred correctly by using source points and checking the imported load summary. If you find this video helpful, please like, comment, and subscribe. To find more information about heat transfer or other topics, check our channel for more how-to videos and visit ansys.com courses today.